Hi, this is Kristen Sapko, and this is my video presentation of my Critical Pedagogy chapter review. The chapter that I chose to look at was Chapter 3, Critical Pedagogy, A Look at the Major Concepts by Peter McLaren. So first, why choose this chapter? Um, I thought of it as a foundation, you know, kind of going back to the beginning, you know, that I would be able to see the main ideas of critical pedagogy in the place that all the other theories stem from. That it would be good to understand the mechanics and kind of the underlying theories to help me come to an under a deeper understanding of the text that we've read and the practices that we've talked about. I also thought that it would help me find strings that kind of led through this entire class and through all of our activities and discussions. So first off, the author. Peter McLaren uh, was born in Canada in 1948. He received most of his education in Canada and his PhD from the University of Toronto. Uh, he now teaches and researches critical pedagogy, uh, political, so political sociology of education, critical theory, Marxist theory, revolutionary social movements, critical race theory, and social justice education. Uh, Paulo Freire once said about him that Peter McLaren is one of the many outstanding intellectual relatives I discovered, and by whom, in turn, I was discovered. I read Peter McLaren long before I came to know him personally. Once I finished reading the first text by McLaren that were made available to me, I was almost certain that we belonged to an identical intellectual family. So I thought this sounded uh, very much like Freire's you know, kind of famous quote, that you have to read the word and read the world. You know, that he read McLaren and, you know, he was in turn you know, discovered more about his own ideas. So he has created uh, many organizations devoted to critical pedagogy, including La Fonction McLaren de Pedagogica Critica at the University of Tijuana and the Freire Project at uh, Chapman University. He has also written and edited over 45 books and written hundreds of articles. So the purpose of this chapter is I mean, critical pedagogy as a whole is really diverse and anamorphic. It can mean any different things and has many different names. But Peter McLaren makes the case that this chapter covers the major similarities that kind of form the backbone of critical pedagogy. And it also helps to create a framework that will assist readers in understanding other works by various critical pedagogues. So what is critical pedagogy? So critical, pe critical pedagogy explores the unequal stratification of society based on gender, race, and class, and finds out ways to challenge and transform these biases. Uh, McLaren states in his chapter, critical pedagogy begins with the premise that men and women are essentially unfree and inhabit a world rife with contradictions and asymmetries of power and privilege. That's from McLaren, page 61. So critical pedagogy, you know, is a philosophy of education, and it tries to create spaces where education moves beyond rote knowledge and becomes a force for empowerment. All right, so the first sort of theory that he talks about is uh, dialectical thinking, and this encourages people to think about problems of society as more than just isolated events to think about them as an interactive context between the individual and society. You know, kind of allowing us to focus on both sides of a social contradiction. For example, school. It's a place of both indoctrination and a cultural terrain that promotes empowerment. So both it both reproduces the dominant class and creates obedient worker bees, but can also empower students for social justice. I think heirs would definitely agree with this. Um, you know, there's many sort of sides to this problem. Then we get into um, some theories that were first suggested by Henry Garreau, which are macro and micro objectives. So the micro objectives are the context of the class, the content of the class. You know, what what are they? What are the standards? What are they learning? You know, in an English class. You know, they're learning about parts of speech, literary devices, author biographies. It's a very narrow focus. Focus. But then we have macro objectives, which these are sort of the big ideas. These are making connections between the content of the class and a larger social reality. This is a broad focus. For example, uh, you know, what relationship between this book and the social climate? 
Um, who benefited from this book being published? Who suffered? What are the class and racial implications of the book? Uh, for example, right now I'm reading The Awakening with my juniors, and we're talking mostly about uh, kind of the gender theory with it. You know, what is a woman's place? How is she, you know, kind of, you know, not following the, the path that, you know, is socially acceptable to her. But there's also a lot of race in the book because most of the, you know, servants and the help are all, uh, you know, all, all, are all Africans or mulattoes or quadroons, you know, and they're, you know, put into this kind of elaborate social structure just based on their race. So we want our students to, you know, move through micro objectives to macro objectives. And this goes back to Paul Gorski, who talks about the principles of equity literacy. He says to look at literature with a critical eye and understand the inequities and motivation of authors uh, that stems from society. You know, we have to teach explicitly about class and bias. All right, then we have uh, the next section of the chapter, which is critical pedagogy and social the social construction of knowledge. So a social construct is is that uh, you know knowledge is the product of consent between the individuals who live out a particular social relation, class, gender, or race, and who live in a particular time. This means that you know knowledge is a social contract. It's constructed by the society we live in. You know what is important to learn and to know depends on where you live and what you have to do. You know Gorski talks about this in Reaching and Teaching, and Gonzalez talks about this in Funds of Knowledge. Uh, the fact that your social relations determine what knowledge is important. If you're, you know, a Native American, it's much more important to learn about the world around you than to learn about the stock market. Um, because, you know, that's what your culture is. That's what your culture deems as more valuable. Um, this sort of leads into, you know, symbols and deconstruction. Because just as knowledge is social con socially constructed, we have symbols that are socially um, constructed. So, you know, a different field of reference would produce a different meaning for a symbol. And this reminded me of uh, the literary theory uh, called deconstruction, which is described in the book Critical Encounters in High School English by Deborah Appleman. And so deconstruction is a postmodern criticism of literature. And it sort of questions these traditional assumptions that, you know, one symbol equals just one thing. You know, it reveals that language is unstable and ambiguous and therefore inherently contradictory. Uh, for example, the word awful uh, used to actually mean inspiring, you know, full of awe. And now it has only negative connotations. Uh, similarly, the word nice used to mean foolish or silly. And now it means, you know, it's a positive. So this is what, you know, critical pedagogues try to do with society and culture. You know, they try to deconstruct these societal and social norms and see how they got there. You know, what's at the core of them? And then how can they be changed? So another important thing with the construction of knowledge is the forms of knowledge. So. Uh, McLaren breaks it down into three parts. We have technical, practical, and emancipatory. So technical, you know, these can be quantified. They're intelligence scores, SAT scores, Lexile scores. Um, then we have practical, which seeks to enlighten people by exploring and describing social situations historically and developmentally. So kind of placing things in a little bit bigger picture, sort of the little bit of the, the macro. Um, and then we have emancipatory, which is kind of the bridge between technical and practical. And this helps to understand how societal relationships are manipulated by relations of power and privilege, but also to understand how they can be changed. You know, this is the foundation for empowerment and social justice. I believe that Ayers and many other pedagogues would say that emancipatory knowledge is the only way to really make a difference and to give students a stake in their own learning. All right, then we've got a uh, class. So class is another social contract. It, uh, Heward says, McLaren says it refers to the economic, social, and political relationships that govern life in a given social order. 
you know, we may not have a caste system you know, like India used to, where you know there's very strict rules and no one can you know, go into the other one. But you know, we're still not fully socially mobile. It takes a lot to move from one socioeconomic level to another. Um, another important thing, sort of as a part of this, is culture. So, so culture is also socially constructed. Uh, McLaren says, I use the term culture to signify the particular way in which, a, in which a social group lives out and makes sense of its given circumstances and conditions in life. In addition to defining culture as a set of practices, ideologies, and values, which different groups draw on to make sense of the world. So, number one, culture is not, or is tied to class, gender, and age, um, and it produces oppression and dependency. But culture is not simply a way of life. It's much more than that. And like Gorski, uh, McLaren states that cultures cannot be assumed by just one factor, like, you know, socioeconomic class. All right, so now that we've talked a little bit about culture in general, uh, McLaren breaks it down into sort of three groups, dominant culture, subordinate culture, and subculture. So dominant culture is you know, the societal practices that affirm the central values of the societal class in charge of the material and symbolic wealth of society, um, in our case, you know, middle class whites. Uh, you know, the dominant culture is also called the culture of power, and according to Delpit in Ayers, uh, if you're not already a participant in the culture of power, being told explicitly the rules of the culture makes acquiring power easier. This is the reason that we need to explicitly teach you know, power and culture and race. Uh, then we have the subordinate culture, which are cultures that live out social societal practices that are subordinate to the main culture, but are still kind of relevant and like widespread. Uh, then we have the subcultures, which is a subset of both. And this, uh, and they use symbols and societal practice that set them apart, you know. Subordinate cultures still kind of want to fit in with the dominant culture, Subcultures, not really interested. You know, you can think of like punk rockers, a great subculture. Uh, then we also have cultural forms, which are, you know, the symbols and societal practices that express culture, like food and religion and dance and education. Uh, a good example is, you know, baseball. It's a good American cultural form. All right, then we have uh, the term hegemony, which is usually used in political science and uh, is defined as the control or domination of a person or organization by another. So a good example of hegemony is American culture. You know, there are McDonald's all over the world. Everybody in the world uses Facebook. You know, U.S. culture like food and clothing, you know, controls many other cultures all over the world and pushes traditional cultures out. You know, these are, uh, hegemony are the terms of reference upon which we compare ourselves. For example, you know, super skinny, white super models, uh, the nuclear family. You know, these are terms of reference that we decide, do we match them or do we, do we fall short? Another good example of this is the American dream. You know, the idea that Americans can pull themselves up by their bootstraps and work hard and gain individual success. This is really, you know, sort of unrealistic. And, you know, there's a lot of devastation that occurs when this doesn't come true. Because being an American carries a lot of ideological baggage. Because we're in a country of contradictions. You know, we say we have freedom for all, equality, equal rights. But as we saw in the movie Precious Knowledge, politicians say we want people who are intelligent thinkers and independent thinkers. But you know, we can't teach them about Mexican heritage or Marx because then they might know both sides of the story and finally see the hypocrisy that human or that Americans truly represent. So we're going to watch a really quick video. Um, it's from the HBO program Newsroom. And uh, there's this uh, gentleman who's, uh, he's a reporter and he runs the sort of new news station and he gets the question at like a college question and answer session why is america the greatest country in the world and so the other two people that he's speaking with you know, respond with freedom and freedom um but he sort of takes a more realistic approach to it
Yeah, you, uh, sorority girl. Just in case you accidentally wander into a voting booth one day, there's some things you should know. And one of them is there is absolutely no evidence to support the statement that we're the greatest country in the world. We're seventh in literacy, 27th in math, 22nd in science, 49th in life expectancy, 178th in infant mortality, third in median household income, number four in labor force, and number four in exports. We lead the world in only three categories. Number of incarcerated citizens per capita, number of adults who believe angels are real, and defense spending, where we spend more than the next 26 countries combined, 25 of whom are allies. Now so as you can see, he, you know, I feel like uh, McLaren would kind of like this guy's attitude, because uh, reading McLaren's personal website, uh, he's a very radical, uh, revolutionary man, and he really believes that critical pedagogy is the way that we can change the world and that we can, you know, stop these sorts of, you know, societal constraints and the stratification of society. All right, so then if we go back to this, um, this also, you know, that video shows that America has been built up. We've been built up to this, you know, greatest country in the world. And, you know, our oppressive features you know, are so rarely challenged that they become a truth that almost can't be touched. Um, another social construct of knowledge is prejudice, which is the negative judgment of others on the basis of unrecognized, unsound, and inadequate evidence. Uh, for example, you know, the Eric Gardner and the Michael Brown uh, cases, and you know, many others who have been killed by police officers. And whether or not the police officers are prejudiced, the people talking about the cases often show that they have extreme prejudice because they go back to a rhetoric of fear and generalizations. Even more damaging is that these prejudices take on like a common sense character, so they're much harder to combat. All right, then we have ideology. So ideology is the product or the production and representation of ideas, values, and beliefs. Um, and the manner in which they are expressed and lived out by both individuals and groups. You know, they're the production of sense and meaning. So these are important because they're the way that we view the world, which we often view as natural or common sense. So constructing these ideologies is good because it helps us make sense of the world, but they can be very bad because they can be very selective. So ideological ideological domination is achieved by kind of five different things. So first we have legitimation, which is that the system of domination is defended because it is being represented as just and legitimate. For example, schools, you know, everyone says, oh, everyone gets the same education no matter where you live. Uh, then we have dissimulation, which relies on the domination of, uh, which in which the realities of domination are often obscured with half-truths. Uh, you know, like tracking, for example, in schools. You know, they say it helps to, you know, improve academic progress, but it really doesn't. It really just separates students by class and doesn't help them learn any better. Uh, then we have unification, which is, you know, the hegemonic, the idea that uh, a hegemonic idea makes people a single entity, often by creating a common enemy. For example, right after 9-11, we all became Americans in that moment. You know, there was no place for any sort of dissenting ideas. Then we also have fragmentation, which is sort of the divide and rule approach, which breaks up potential opposition so they cannot gain power. For example, um, you know, keeping African Americans and Hispanics fighting each other so that they can't fight the white establishment. Finally, we have a reification, which is when transitory states are presented as natural and permanent. Uh, McLaren talks about this with like the great books. And we talked a lot about this in class with Beowulf. You know, that we study these great books that are going to be great forever, but we don't really know that. And they just continue a dominant ideology and solidifies the social hierarchy. All right, then we have a dominant ideology, which is the beliefs and values shared by the majority of individuals. We sort of illustrated this with a picture. So, you know, most Americans believe that capitalism is better than socialism. So, you know, they pick two pictures of uh, Cuba, you know, one, you know, in the 1950s, and then one more modern day and showed, you know, nothing should change. Capitalism is bad. And then they showed, you know, how far capitalism has come or how much capitalism has allowed a place to change and how much, you know, flashy lights and technology they have. Uh, but then we have opposite ideology, 
which uh, they challenge the dominant ideologies and shatter stereotypes. Um, Lisa Delpit talks a lot about this in, um, in her book, and she says that in order to teach students of color and other groups who don't feel like they fit into the dominant ideology, we have to realize this oppositional ideology and realize that the problem is that the cultural framework of our country has almost, since its inception, dictated that black is bad and less than in all areas, and in all areas, white is good and superior. This perspective is so ingrained and so normalized that we stumble through our days with our eyes closed to avoid seeing it. So, you know, we have to realize the dominant the dominant ideology is not the only one, and that we need to be systematic in our resistance to dominant ideology, because dominant ideology is very good at maintaining its hegemony. Uh, McLaren talks about, you know, the fact, you know, how good dominant ideology is at maintaining its hegemony. One of the ways it does this is by, you know, allowing token op opposition. So McLaren says that when he was a teacher, he had, um, you know, middle school students, and they were allowed to have dances sort of glorified the values and meanings and pleasures of life on the street. And it was tolerated because it diffused tension at the school and gave students a piece of this symbolic space. But it didn't really redress anything concrete in terms of their life in the subordinate culture. So teachers must be critical of school practices that push dominant ideology on students like tracking low-level teaching strategies, teacher-centered lessons, and question whether they empower the students or do they just reinforce the ideas that the teacher, you know, the teacher is always right and that the teacher is the moral gatekeeper of the state. You know, we need to ask, how do the dominant ideologies of the teacher help, the, help to structure the subjectivity of the students? All right, so then we have uh, the next section that McLaren goes into, which is critical pedagogy and the knowledge power relation. So one of the main ideas of critical pedagogy is that knowledge and power are linked. Um, dominant culture tries to separate this and make knowledge of something that can be mastered and something that can you know, be a tool for social mobility, but it has so many facets that it's very hard to master. So power relations are described in what Michel Foucault refers to as a discourse or a family of concepts. So discourses are made up of discursive practices, which are rules that can govern what can be said and what um, must remain unsaid, who can speak with authority and who must listen. You know, we have regimes of truth, which are the dominant discourses. You know, in schools, they can be applied to the books that we read, the classroom approaches that we apply, and the values and beliefs that we transmit to our students. Um, critical discourse, on the other hand, focuses on the interests and assumptions that inform the knowledge itself. So for instance, uh, the dominant discourse, you know, would probably be about, you know, a work by a white male author like Shakespeare, and the impact they made on the world and how perfect their writing was. Uh, but the critical discourse, on the other hand, would ask, all right, how did Shakespeare's plays reinforce the status quo? What flaws did he have in his writing? What prejudice does he show, you know, against blacks in Othello or against women in pretty much all of his plays? This proves that the truth is perspective. Uh, it's all socially constructed. So as you can see in this picture, it kind of illustrates this, that, you know, when a person is trying to look to truth, what they end up seeing is just their beliefs reflected back to them. Uh, then we have the final piece of sort of power and knowledge, which is empowerment. So the un so it's students can gain empowerment by understanding the fact that truth and knowledge are socially constructed. You know, teachers need to recognize that power relations correspond to forms of school knowledge that distort the understanding and produce what is commonly accepted as truth. Uh, I think this can be seen in multiplication is for white people when they were, you know, giving that intelligent test to the tribesmen and they kept putting it one way, which was you know, not the correct way, but, uh, you know, it was the way that made sense to them. Whereas when they asked them, you know, how would a fool do it? They did it the correct way. So 
when we're looking at text, we need to realize, you know, and decide, is this expletive? You know, is it is it going to exploit other people while I read it? You know, is it true? Is it not true? Questions that we need to ask. Does this text promote stereotypes about women or minorities? Do they reinforce patriarchal attitudes? Do they further demon, uh, demonize the working class? I think this can be shown a lot of times with African American authors because a lot of times they're read only in connection to slave narratives. You know, no, very few contemporary African American authors are read. All right, so we move on to the next section of the chapter, which is critical pedagogy and the curriculum. So McLaren states, the curriculum represents much more than just a program of study, uh, you know, a classroom text or a class syllabus. It's the introduction to a particular form of life. It serves to prepare students for the dominant or subordinate positions in the existing society. So, I mean, this shows that curriculum favors certain knowledge over others. Oh, uh, it sort of leads into the hidden curriculum, which is the underlying or unintended outcomes of the schooling process. So, something that I find interesting about the hidden curriculum is that teachers usually are not always aware of them, but students almost always are. Um, you know, students can always tell uh, whether a teacher is prepared or not for class, and they can always tell, you know, whether a teacher favors someone, uh, you know, one student over another. Um, Delpit in Ayers states that those with a, with uh, less power are more aware of hidden curriculum's existence um, because they're more subject to it. Uh, this also ties into prejudice because you know they talk about they've done studies that, you know, teachers believe that girls talk more and boys should be more aggressive and you know because because boys are rewarded for aggressive behavior and you know boys are encouraged to be more dependent whereas girls are encouraged to be dependent and so this proves that you know we have to be very mindful of the curriculum that we teach because whether or not what we're teaching on the surface is good or bad there's a lot of hidden curriculum underneath of it um, we need to be aware that you know no curriculum is ideologically or politically innocent so we need to identify the most damaging curriculum and replace it with critical discourse that offsets the undemocratic and oppressive nature of most schooling. Finally, we have a curriculum as a form of cultural politics. So schools are places where dominant cultures are represented by the teacher and the subordinate cultures are represented by the students. And so, you know, uh, McLaren says that schools are places where classrooms and street corners collide. So uh, students can gain empowerment by learning about knowledge and social relations that dignify their own history and language and cultural traditions. I thought this tied in perfectly to the ethnic studies classes uh, that we learned about in Precious Knowledge and that LAUSD is making a part of their A through G requirements. Um, and so this shows that you know self-confirmation and thinking critically about the social order that surrounds them is good for students and helps them to feel more empowered. All right, then we have uh, critical pedagogy and social reproduction. So social reproduction is uh, the way that schools reproduce or perpetuate the social relationships and attitudes needed to sustain uh, the existing dominant economic and class relations of the larger society. So um, as Ken Robinson would say in, in his TED Talk video, uh, schools are factories. They're made to keep things the way they are, keep the status quo, keep uh, you know plugging pegs into the machine and making it run smoothly. Um, you know, in Precious Knowledge, politicians said that they wanted a knowledgeable population but they really want them to just be indoctrinated on the idea that America is the best and that it can do no wrong. All right, then we have, uh, oh, sorry, let me go back. Then we have theories of resistance. So theories of resistance are what challenge this social reproduction and they challenge the role of schools as democratic institutions that seek to improve the social positions of all students. Uh, these theories realize that schools just try to prolong the status quo and not really make any changes. 
So teachers must be aware of this because we do not want to go along with the factory model. Um, one of the most profound things that I thought was said in this chapter was, ignorance is not a passive state, but rather an active one. An active excluding from the consciousness. So, you know, ignorance is not just that you don't know, but it's that you are actively excluding it and not wanting to know. You know, ignorance is what we choose not to know. And this leads into theories of resistance, because once you realize that ignorance is an active state, you know, teachers and students can begin to combat it. So teachers need to remember that social constructs can be unmade and remade and made over. But teachers just need to create a space where this agenda is possible. All right. Then we have um, cultural capital. So since schools function on this reproduction of social and cultural dominant theories, um, we want to try and combat this. One of the ways to do this is steering students to construct new social rules and ideas. And so this can be done first with cultural capital, which is the ways of talking, acting, modes of style, moving, socializing, and forms of knowledge, uh, language practices, and values that a certain group has. Um, and this is hard for some teachers because many elements of a student's cultural capital are unfamiliar to teachers, um, especially if they're of different social classes or different races or different genders. And so teachers see traits like tardiness, ways of speaking, gesturing, dressing, as qualities that are inferior, but they're really just part of their cultural capital because in their lives outside of school, it helps them to succeed. For example, traits like interrupting or yelling may be disruptive and frowned upon in school, but at home, if there are many family members, this may be necessary to be heard at all. Um, another example is that schools affirm uh, middle-class speech and devalue students who use a working-class speech. This can be hard for teachers because, um, just like all other groups, we feel the most comfortable with a cultural capital that mirrors our own because that's what we're familiar with. Uh, but we need to you know, step outside our box and understand the cultural capital of our students. Finally, uh, we have funds of knowledge. So funds of knowledge is the currency that this cultural capital builds into. You know, this is uh, defined uh, by Gonzales as the means of knowledge that students have uh, from their home life. Example, what they speak at home, their religion, where they live, what foods they eat. Um, an example of this comes from the new teacher book. Um, and they talk about uh, Native American students. It's a letter to a you know, to a teacher from a Native American parent and it says, you know, do not think that my student is not smart because he doesn't know his letters or his sounds, but think of him as, you know, very intelligent because he knows the names of all the plants near our house. He knows the names of all the birds in the sky. You know, he knows the things that are important to his cultural capital. And if they're not important to your cultural capital, don't devalue them. So finally, in conclusion, uh, critical pedagogy is essential to creating an informed and empowered student body and to create a future that is not led by mindless, socially reproduced slaves. Uh, as this picture shows, critical pedagogy is a very complex theory and a complex map of ideas, but through this chapter I gained a better understanding of the themes and big ideas that shape critical pedagogy as a whole. Thank you so much for listening. This was Kristen Savko. Have a good day.